Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are uh, delighted to have Dr. Andrew Nixon uh, present to us today on frailty assessment uh, in uh, chronic kidney disease. Um, Dr. Nixon is a consultant nephrologist and the supportive care lead in the uh, Department of Renal Medicine and Lancashire Teaching Hospitals. And he's also an honorary lecturer at the University of Manchester. Uh, he graduated in 2009 from the University of Edinburgh uh, before moving to Lancashire. And he's got a PhD from the University of Manchester in 2021 for his thesis on the same topic. So, you know, he's, he's pretty passionate about this, I presume. Uh, he co-leads the NIHR program development grant, which is informing the development of study on comprehensive geriatric assessment in the nephrology setting. Uh, and I'm sure we'll hear more about uh, that today. Um, thanks, uh, Dr. Nixon, for being here today with us virtually. Uh, thank you so much for that that lovely uh, introduction and also the invitation, uh, the invitation to, to talk to you today about, as you say, something I'm very, very passionate about, um, frailty assessment and management in, in chronic kidney disease. So without further ado, I'll uh, I'll get I'll get that. These are my my disclosures. So for today, I thought we'd try and cover three main objectives. Can you hear me? We lost you for a second there. You were talking uh, yeah, about it's, yeah. Maybe a bandwidth issue. Yeah, why did you try again? Okay. Um, so I was hoping today we'd try and address three objectives. And you can tell me at the end whether we whether if I, I've managed to achieve that. So number one, we're going to describe the relevance of frailty for nephrology. Two, apply frailty assessment methodology uh, in clinical practice. And three, discuss how we can go about trying to improve outcomes for people living with frailty and chronic kidney disease. So let's start off by asking ourselves, what is frailty and, and why is it important for nephrology? Simply, frailty is a state of increased vulnerability to disproportionate changes in health status when exposed to a, a stressor event. And that could be something minor, like a, a simple trip or an infection. And, and it's thought to be the result of a, a cumulative decline across multiple physiological systems with a consequent erosion of homeostatic reserve. This is an old figure, but I use it time and time again because I think it elegantly demonstrates the difference between an individual who is frail and an individual who is non-frail or robust. When it exposed to the same event, a frail individual may become dependent on others for their care needs and their recovery may be more prolonged and they may not return back to their previous ba functional baseline, as you can see with the, the, the line there that's in red. So frailty is this age associated decline in physiological reserve. But what we find in chronic kidney disease is that many of the associated pathophysiological processes contribute to sarcopenia, premature aging and the frailty syndrome. This uh, figure uh, is, is a simplified schematic of some of the pathophysiological processes in, involved, including uh, increased inflammatory burden, dysregulation of anabolic hormones and, and premature cellular senescence. And what we find is that there is a notably higher prevalence of frailty in CKD populations as compared to the general older population. So in the general older population, it, do, it does check, depend on how you measure frailty and we'll come on to that. But in the general older population, you're looking at a prevalence of about 10, 12 percent. Um, in an advanced CKD population, there's a poor prevalence of 34%. In those receiving dialysis, it goes high still at 40%. And actually, in, in a pre-selected population of individuals who, who are being considered for, for transplant, the prevalence is still greater than the general older population at 17%. And what happens when when kidney function starts to decline? Well, th this is a visual abstract of work published by the Canadian Frailty uh, observation and interventions trial, the, the CANFIT trial, they measured physical function in older adults with chronic kidney disease. And what they found was that patients with advanced chronic kidney disease experienced progressive declines in physical activity and function. But importantly, this decline accelerated on transition to dialysis. This is a, a visual abstract um, 
from a study uh, from a group in the Netherlands. They, they measured frailty again on initiation of, of, of maintenance dialysis and also functional status, so measuring activities of daily living and caregiver burden. And what they nicely demonstrated was that there was a decline in functional status and an associated increase in caregiver burden for older adults on initiation of maintenance dialysis. And that, that risk was greatest for those individuals living with frailty. Which brings me to this figure published in a, in a C. Jason editorial in 2022. It's a really nice uh, editorial and, and I really like this figure because I, th I think it, it represents a situation that you're probably familiar with whereby we see an older person living with frailty who may start dialysis and over the following year or so may have hospitalizations after which their functional status declines and they don't quite recover to their pre-hospitalization baseline. And what I think we need to be doing as a, as a community is focusing on our efforts and how we can try and mitigate these risks and help, and help older people with chronic kidney disease and frailty live as well as possible for as long as possible. So I thought it would be nice to try and weave in some video clips into the talk. Hopefully the IT will allow us. And um, these are clips from an interview between myself and an older gent gentleman. We'll call him Edward. That's not his real name, but he's a gentleman who lives with frailty and advanced CKD. Um, and I hope it's helpful to share his lived experience. In later clips, we'll meet um, his wife and we'll, we'll, we'll call her Edna for today. Now, words and comments that, that, that struck me when I, when I was watching this back was, well, one, he's, he's feeling more tired. And this is a common experience of a person living with chronic kidney disease and a person living with frailty. His mobility's declined. He's walking with a stick now and he has an associated fear of falling. But above all else, he's wanting to live what he considers a normal life for as much as, um, as, much as possible. And again, I imagine these are experiences that um, you may be familiar with for people that you that you care for who are living with advanced chronic kidney disease and, and, and frailty. So how should we assess frailty? And bear with me here, I'm going to kind of nerd out a little bit on, on conceptual models of frailty, but we won't spend too much time on this. In recent years, there have been efforts to create an operationalized definition of frailty. This is to aid its diagnosis and categorize its severity. There are two principal conceptual models of frailty. We have what's called the physical frailty model or frailty phenotype or freed frailty criteria. It's called lots of different things, but it's considered a biological syndrome of decreased reserve and resistance to stresses like infections and falls and starting dialysis. It comprises five components, weakness, slowness, unintentional weight loss, fatigue, and low physical activity. And if an individual has three or more components, they're categorized as frail, one or two, and they're categorized as pre-frail. And importantly, the studies have demonstrated that if you're categorized as pre-frail, this precursor to frailty, you have worse outcomes than somebody who's robust, non-frail. And then those who are categorized as frail have worse outcomes still. So we, can, we need to think about frailty not as a dichotomous state along a spectrum. Now, when it, the, 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 other, the other model that you can see on the slide, there's something called the cumulative deficit model of frailty, or it's also known as a frailty index. Now, this takes a more holistic view and it hypothesizes that the accumulation of health and functional problems across the whole person serves as an indicator of an individual's aging related health state. Now, although they differ in their underlying theories, both models have been shown to predict outcomes in older adults. And I include this slide here simply to demonstrate that the frailty phenotype is by far and away the most well studied frailty assessment in, in CKD populations. This, these figures are taken from a scoping review from last year, over 50% of the studies that they included. So um, there were 90 that they found had uh, used the frailty phenotype. 
as their as the, the method of assessing frailty. And it's across all sorts of different populations, as you can see. We've got uh, advanced CKD, peritoneal dialysis, transplant hemodialysis, transplant candidacy as well. I picked this recent study to serve as an example. So th this is work from the chronic renal insufficiency cohort investigators, the, the CRIC investigators. They assessed frailty using the, the frailty phenotype in over two and a half thousand adults with CKD and they had a median follow up of, of over 11 years. And they demonstrated that the frailty phenotype category was independently associated with mortality, with pre-frail individuals having greater risk than robust individuals, and frail individuals having the greatest risk overall. So quite, quite robust evidence there that frailty as categorized by the frailty phenotype is associated with outcomes in chronic kidney disease populations. And in this slide, I've summarized findings across lots of different patient groups. There's been, as, I, as I've said already, multiple studies that have looked at the frailty phenotype, and they've been associated with not only mortality, but a greater risk of starting dialysis, prolonged post-dialysis recovery, increased symptom burden, reduced health-related quality of life. And also in the transplant setting, it's been shown to predict outcomes, both on the wait list and, and following transplantation. Um, I was involved in some work a few years ago where we looked at patient reported outcomes in people with frailty, and we used a modified version of the frailty phenotype where we subjected some of the more objective measures of walking speed and grip strength for, for self-report measures. We had over 350 patients who were recruited and we demonstrated in this work that frailty was independently associated with higher total symptom burden, lower health related quality of life scores. And, and interestingly, there seemed to be a distinctive frailty experience uh, for, for individuals living with frailty in advanced CKD. Now, there aren't as many studies looking at the frailty index in CKD population, and um, this is uh, uh, data from a study uh, that was led by Dr. Tom Wilkinson in Leicester in the UK. Um, it, Tom used a large primary care da data uh, base, which was linked to hospital episode statistics, to look at the association between frailty using a frailty index and outcomes. So in this in this uh, study, there are over eight hundred thousand patients. Now in the UK, we have something called an electronic frailty index. So this is commonly used now in primary care due to its ease of, of, of use. So it basically uses existing primary care uh, electronic records to, to calculate a frailty index. And it's very good um, and particularly good at identifying a at risk population. So if you want to stratify a large population, this is really good. You plumb in some numbers and you get a score and you can you can identify who those who who are most at risk and, and perhaps need uh, more in-depth assessment. Now the top table demonstrates the hazard ratio for all cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality for, for both chronic kidney disease and, and no chronic kidney disease groups. And the risk goes up with frailty category. Uh, the figure below demonstrates the survival probability for the frailty groups. Now, there were small differences between 10 year predicted survival between CKD and, and no CKD within each frailty level, suggesting that CKD does affect survival, but by far and away the largest effect overall was, was, was frailty category. So if you're an individual living with se severe frailty, th the important thing is you're living with severe frailty, not that you're living with CKD. Um, and that's something to think about and maybe we want to talk about what, you know, the, the, the carefree, uh, carefree equations and, and how that may uh, relate to, to severe frailty. Now, this is a, a visual abstract published in 2022 by Dr. Rashida Hall, uh, who's a nephrologist and researcher in the US. And uh, Dr. Hall and authors uh, applied, again, a frailty index, and this was a, using administrative data, to uh, patients, in this case, receiving dialysis, hemodialysis. And they demonstrated that it was independently associated with increased risk of death and hospitalization. Again, a good example in a large cohort of a frailty index, identifying that those group of people who we need to do more for. Now, you may say that's that's all well and good, Andy, when you're doing research or you can access a frailty index from healthcare records or spend half an hour doing a frailty phenotype assessment. But in the real world, that just isn't practical. And in any case, I, I know when someone is frail. I don't need someone to, to tell me this. Well, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you on the, your, the first point. Um, I'm not sure how practical it is really to do frailty phenotype assessments in clinical practice. And I, I 
you know, I work in the UK where there is the electronic frailty index and I can't see these scores because they're in the primary care world. Uh, so I, I do think there's some work to be done there. However, I hope to convince you that we do need some help when it comes to frailty assessments. This is a, a visual abstract from, uh, again, from data from the CANFIT study investigators. They measured frailty and asked healthcare professionals about their perception, their per perceived frailty status of, of, of patients they were, were caring for. And they found that the agreement between objective and subjective measures of frailty and physical function was poor. And it was actually the more objective measures that were more likely to be associated with mortality. But interestingly, it was the subjective assessments that were more strongly associated with dialysis modality choice. In this study, if an individual was perceived as being frail, they were more likely to dialyze in hospital rather than at home. So I, I can inf infer from this that we are instinctively using frailty to inform our decision making, whether we measure it or not. Um, but I think if we are just relying on our own perceptions, we, we're doing patients a disservice because we're not measuring frailty as well as we, pop, as we can do. Now, when I was starting out um, as a, a, my PhD a few, a few years ago, I was thinking about this and how, how can we try and identify frailty in a practical way, but that is, is accurate um, in a busy clinical setting. So we looked at a variety of uh, screening methods for frailty and used the frailty phenotype as our reference standard. And these measures included things like walking speed, hand grip strength, and, and a questionnaire based tool called the Prisma 7, along with something called the clinical frailty scale or, or Rockwood clinical frailty scale, which I'm, I'm imagining many of you will be familiar with, but I'll be interested to hear about that after the, the talk. Um, now, we found that the, the, the clinical frailty scale performed very well as a, a screening tool for frailty with an AUC value of 0.9, one being a perfect test. For those of you not familiar, it's, it's, um, well, it's no, often called the Rockwood Clinical Frailty Scale after the lead author, Professor Rockwood, flying the flag for, for Canada here. He's uh, it's published extensively in, the, in this field. Um, it's a nine point scale that summarises a frailty assessment and um, is a useful way, I think, of communicating your assessment to other healthcare professionals. It's very quick to do. It's made even easier by the fact that there's an app. <laughs> there's an app for it now. Um, but we need to acknowledge that there is subjectivity in this screening tool. So if you're going to use it, I urge you to uh, to, to complete some of the brief training that there is available online. And th these are just an example of, of some resources there. I should mention that, by the way, these, these QR codes hopefully will take you to the, 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 the things that I'm referencing in the paper. Uh, in the talk, sorry. So I've shown you data on the clinical frailty scale and its ability to uh, screen for frailty. What, but what about its association with outcomes? This is a, a visual abstract published in NDT from the fitness study in the UK. And this is a study that evaluated frailty using several different measures. And what they demonstrated was that the clinical frailty scale was associated with, with outcomes, hospitalisation and mortality. In fact, it was the only measure that was associated with both hospitalisation and mortality in this group of, of dialysis, patients receiving dialysis. And then there's a, a similar study published last year from Japan that looked again at frailty screen, screening tools in hemodialysis population. And similarly, they found that it was associated with adverse outcomes. And interestingly, they found that the questionnaire based approaches didn't quite perform as well. Now, using a, a quality improvement approach, we, we implemented frailty screening within our department using the clinical frailty scale a few years ago, and this was in a hemodialysis units, so it was performed quarterly on the hemodialysis units. We did it in nephrolo outpatient nephrology clinics and also in, on the inpatient ward as well. And then we published um, some of the outpatient data a few years ago. This was 450 outpatients. It's not research, this is kind of real world data. And it, it was a heterogeneous population. So we had advanced CKD, hemodialysis patients as well. A third were screened as frail. And importantly, more frail patients were hospitalized and more, more died than their non-frail counterparts. In fact, there was over two-fold increase in, the, the, in death per point increase in the clinical frail scale. And I, we thought this was important locally because we were demonstrating that the clinical frailty scale was doing what it was meant to do. It was to identify patients at risk of adverse outcomes, ones who we maybe should be doing.
Yeah, that go ahead now. We lost you for a second. Hi, I lost you there. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. that was just a connection issue. Now we also have data going back a few years from um, the fee pod studies in the in the UK, that, and they they also demonstrate an association between the clinical friend scale, scale scores and this time patient reported outcomes. So it was associated with increased symptom burden, health related quality of life, and depression. And this was in uh, a population of people uh, receiving assisted peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis, and a conservative care cohort. So. That was that's a whistle stop tour through through frailty. I mean, a lot of information, and I thought I'd just distill it to a few recommendations for practice. So I think if you want a brief frailty screening tool and you're prepared to do a little bit of training, I, I think you can't go wrong with the, the clinical frailty scale. Certainly, when it comes to the most robust evidence base, the frailty phenotypes you guide, but it does take a bit more time to complete, and it's, so it's not necessarily the easiest to implement in in, in routine care. And then I think if you want to seg segment a large population, you want to stratify by frailty risk and, and you've got access to a decent amount of electronic patient data that I think a frailty index really has the greatest utility there. Now, I thought we'd come back to Edward and, and now we meet, meet his wife, Edna, as they talk about what's important to them uh, thinking about the, uh, their, their lives now. Again, thinking about what, what stands out, uh, certainly to me, he is how much he wants to maintain his own independence, how he doesn't want his health to impact on others. He doesn't want to be considered a, a burden, even though I'm sure his family are more than happy to be supporting him. People living with frailty and kidney disease want to continue doing activities in life meaningful to them, continue doing or uh, fulfilling social roles, and, and protect some semblance of normality where, where possible. And I'd just like you to hold on to that while we move on to, to the next section. So, how can we improve outcomes for people living with frailty and CKD? Well, we, I've spoken a lot about frailty, and I'm now going to try to convince you that we need to try and assess other geriatric impairments as well. And these are things like mobility, falls, function, cognitive impairment and it's something that I think we should be doing within nephrology because we we're the ones seeing these patients uh, frequently the, these are results presented here from a study from the Netherlands they found uh, they looked at a dialysis population and a, and, a, and a conservative care group and they found that um, nearly 80 percent of the dialysis population had two or more geriatric impairments and nearly 90 percent of, of the conservative care population again had two or more geriatric impairments so highly prevalent high prevalence of geriatric impairments in this in these these older populations now just working down the table I, um, I don't know if you can see my 
my uh, cursor, um, you can see the impairment of cogn uh, cogn cognitive tests. So you've got um, uh, over two thirds in both groups having at least one uh, impairment in, in cognition when it comes to those tests. And if we go down to uh, ADLs, so this is uh, intermediate activities of daily living, and um, that's tasks related uh, to, to maintaining an independent household. You can see there, eight, nearly 80% 80 of the diagnostic population have some impairment in activities of daily living and over 80% of their conservative care group. So significant um, burden of geriatric impairments in, in, in older people with advanced CKD. And it may come as no surprise that geriatric impairments are also associated with outcomes. This, this is again data from the Crick study uh, investigators and it includes Eight, over 800 participants with CKD and they demonstrated when they, they when they uh, looked at geriatric impairments and geriatric impairment burden there was a worse um, there was an association with worse outcomes including death dialysis initiation and hospitalization so we should be trying to identify these shouldn't we if we don't know about geriatric impairments we can't do anything about them and try and improve the associated adverse outcomes now this is where we need to look at look to geriatric medicine as evidence is still needed within within nephrology and within the, how to implement within nephrology services. Comprehensive geriatric assessment is considered essentially the gold standard of care of older adults. It's a bit of a misnomer as this is an approach to care and it's not just about the assessments, but the associated interventions, the associated person centred care plan that you implement. It's defined as a multidimensional, multidisciplinary process which identifies medical, social, functional needs and leads to the development of an integrated, coordinated care plan to meet those needs. So you can see here um, on the, the figure what some of the domains that you might have within a comprehensive geriatric assessment. Now, there are also, there's also something called a modified geriatric assessment. Or for simplicity, I'll just refer to it as geriatric assessment. And this is where you have a trained healthcare professional who performs a multi-domain assessment, but it doesn't necessarily involve all different members of the MDT at that point. But you may bring in the MDT at a later point, either through meetings or referrals. Um, so importantly, when you do this, this assessment, whether it be whether it's comprehensive geriatric assessment or geriatric assessment, you identify problems, you identify goals, values and preferences, and then through shared decision making, develop a person centred care plan, which may include targeted interventions. It may include referrals to uh, onward secondary care uh, teams, whether that be, for example, a fourth management service or in the community, community physiotherapists, uh, social services, etc. And um, it may, uh, and, and, and this, this is where I think uh, where research is needed, but I, I think there's a role here for informing our decision making when it comes to future kidney care as well. And it's not a one stop shop. It's it's something that you put in a, a, a care plan and you re revisit it, especially um, if there has been um, a, a, you know, a, a hospitalization, a potential change in health status, as we spoke about frailty earlier. That's when we should be performing a reassessment to re-identify what problems there are and how we may go about addressing them. So just to show it can be done, uh, I thought we'd share some of the work we did a few years ago now. We had some funding from a charity called Kidney Care UK, and this was to appoint an occupational therapist one day a week for a year. And we collaborated with our hospital frailty team who helped us develop a home-based multi-domain geriatric assessment. And these were for patients with advanced CKD who were screened as living with frailty. And you can see in the table here that the, the problems that we'd identified, there was a median of, I mean, this, I, admittedly, these are small numbers, but there was a median of uh, five identified problems for each patient, many of which were largely unknown prior to them undergoing this geriatric assessment. All patients had problems with in, in, uh, intermediate uh, activities of daily living, and a significant proportion had problems with basic activities of daily living. Falls are obviously particularly concerning for those with advanced chronic kidney disease because of the, there's increased risk of fall related injuries and um, 26 patients had at least one fall in the preceding 12 months. That's 26 of the 35 and uh, nearly all were considered at risk of future falls. And I would add those that had been falling, most of which haven't actually 
into a healthcare professional about it. So it was just so happened that they'd fallen and hadn't suffered a, a severe injury. But I, I, I've certainly, um, I'm sure you'll you'll agree that there are, we see a lot of morbidity associated uh, with falls uh, when it comes to advanced CKD populations, uh, advanced CKD patients. So patients who received a geriatric assessment were discussed at a monthly MDT meeting during which problems and associated clinical needs were discussed. We developed a management plan um, and we also in that meeting, we considered the appropriateness of, of initiating advanced care planning discussions. So we used that as an opportunity to, 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 to have these conversations with patients, particularly those who were living with more severe frailty and, and, and a higher geriatric impairment burden. But do we have evidence that geriatric assessment improves outcomes? That's the big, big question. And I, I, there is still many studies that are on, ongoing, which I'll, I will flag. But I will, um, I would like to share this qualitative study published in 2021. This is again from a research group in the Netherlands that demonstrated that geriatric assessment was useful for patients with advanced CKD to identify trends in geriatric domain. So these are they're interviewing healthcare professionals uh, who are. are who are helping deliver these assessments alongside the patients and the healthcare professionals felt that they were getting to know their patients better and it meant because they were tracking these geriatric domains over time when they started to notice a change it provided them a reason to set put in a targeted intervention to try and improve outcomes what i also thought was interesting from this work is that patients felt more able to share fears concerns and concerns about treatment choices now i think we think we're pretty good at this in nephrology, but actually this patients felt was even better. So but doing doing geriatric assessment in this way, patients felt more able to share their fears and concerns about the different treatment options available. And in some instances, it helped initiate dialogue on treatment decisions and prompt the reconsideration of different options, whether that be thinking about conservative care rather than dial a dialysis option or, or a home therapy, a home hemodialysis that was thought maybe they, they weren't able to do it, but actually that was uh, uh, that are perceived frailty and actually really that, that they, were, they were they were able to do more than, than what was originally thought. Um, so this is this group in the Netherlands, uh, the, the study group is called the Polder study group and they've actually recently published their implementation study in which they identify um, barriers and facilitators to geriatric assessment across 10 centres and ultimately they demonstrated that geriatric assessment could be successfully integrated into CKD care and by the healthcare professionals involved it was perceived as as, as relevant. So some evidence there to say that this can be done and it can be done on, on, a, on a larger scale. But it's not yet known if CGA leads to improved outcomes in CKD populations, including hospitalisation, mortality, health related quality of life. But these are some of the studies that are underway evaluating the effectiveness of geriatric assessment in different CKD populations. And, and transplantation as well. And, ho and hopefully it will provide more evidence on how best to implement it within nephrology services. But I'd add, geriatric assessment, it, it's not, I mean, it's, it's not a new thing. This is, this is already in nephrology guidelines, certainly some. And this, um, this is from the European Renal Best Practice uh, Group Clinical Practice Guideline. It's on the management of older patients with CKD. It's a few years old now, as you can see, 2017. But within it, they recommended that functional status should be assessed in older patients with CKD with a view to identifying those who would benefit from geriatric assessment. And this is way before we've had all the, you know, these RCTs that are, are now underway, because it, it just makes sense, right? We should be doing this. This is from more recent ISPD practice recommendations, which recommend that goals of care and care needs are determined after appropriate geriatric assessment. Again, another guideline, international guideline, where, where it's recommended. I was recently involved in writing a, a, a chapter for the Euro European Renal Association, um, it's called the ERA-NEF manual, which is kind of like an online uh, book for, for, for uh, trainees who are, are going to undergo the, 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 the specialty exam. Um, and now within this, we recommended a broad healthcare needs assessment al alongside symptom assessment and establishing goals, values and preferences in older people with advanced CKD. And which really, they're all components of comprehensive geriatric assessment. It's just we've split them up in that way. Um, now, you again may say, well, that's all very well, but I don't have time to do this. I really, I, I'm already busy managing phosphate and blood pressure and, and all the other things that we have to do. 
Um, but I would say to you just just to start small and chunk it. Now we 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 unfortunately don't have the funding to continue the the, the, the therapist that we had, but it doesn't mean I don't start stop thinking about the relevance of geriatric impairments for the patients that I'm caring for. Um, I would say try and keep it simple. Uh, I, I try and I try to make it catchy by thinking of the four F's. So frailty, falls and mobility and mobility, function, so that's your activities of daily living, and forgetfulness, cognition. Now you don't need to do all at every clinical encounter. That's that's the beauty of nephrology. We get to know our patients so well and we look after them, hopefully, for years. So, but what you can do is focus on one or two at a time and then track them over time so that when you start to notice things changing, you can intervene in a timely matter, manner. Um, there's one thing I have added, and I've not spent a huge amount of time talking about this, but we have spoken about symptom burden in, in people living with frailty. And, and actually what I do now in practice is a regular structured symptom assessment. Um, I use something called the IPOS renal, which is a, a questionnaire based tool to maximise my, my chance of identifying symptoms that are important for, for the individual so that I can try and identify them. I actually ask patients to complete complete them in the uh, the waiting room so that when they come into the consultation and, and that they've been doing it for a while now, so they know what they're very familiar with it. The first thing they give me is this symptom burden questionnaire. And I can immediately see, and it doesn't project very well there, but there's the top three things that are bothering them. And that's what we focus on first. We don't focus on phosphate and anemia blood pressure. We focus on what is bothering you. And that helps structure the consultation, helps, I hope, helps me to try and deliver that person-centered care that we're, we're aiming for. Now, I wanted to just mention about frailty and, and, and we need to remember that it's a dynamic state. So we've talked about it getting worse, but it, it can get better. Admittedly, trying to identify who who's will get better is, is tricky. It is tricky. And certainly those individuals with more severe frailty, um, it's less likely to. But there are um, there is evidence to suggest that it can get better. This, this is from a US study from 2019, where they assessed frailty status at the time of transplant candidacy evaluation. And then again, at admission for when they performed the kidney transplant. And they found that over 20% of uh, patients became more frail and over 20% became less frail. But importantly, if you if you draw your eye here, it was the individuals who were who had a worsening frailty status who had the worst outcomes. So it, it wasn't, you know, if you had a stable score, it, it wasn't as important as if your score was dropping. And I think that that's important for two reasons. One, it highlights that we need to reassess frailty. You know, we can't just do it once and then forget about it. You know, you've been screened today as not being frail, so we don't need to think about it again. That's not, we need to keep uh, reassessing these at time at time points in the future. But it's also important uh, to recognise that frailty status can improve, and that means that potentially there are interventions that may increase the chances of improvement. Now, one such intervention to think about is exercise, physical activity. Um, there is evidence for this in in the older adult population, and um, we were. We were thinking about this a few years ago, we performed a pilot RCT looking at a 12 week home exercise program for people with advanced CKD living with pre frailty and frailty. We found that it was safe, it was feasible. And again, it, this, it isn't powered to detect changes, but we did do some interviews with patients, some qualitative work and pay, participants reported improved fitness, balance, strength, well-being, energy levels and confidence. Now, I'd qualify these findings by saying that most of the participants in this pilot had pre frailty or mild frailty, so they weren't in the more moderate or severe spectrum of frailty. But I still think we provided some preliminary evidence that exercise could be beneficial for people living with, with frailty and CKD and, 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 and appears to be safe. Others have done similarly. This is a, a, another small study looking at exercise in this is in transplant candidates. And they found an improvement in frailty and physical function. Again, small numbers, but a signal there that it is safe and uh, we should be looking at this in, in more detail in research. And there are, I'm pleased to say, studies ongoing looking at this. And actually what, what, what they're looking at are multimodal interventions. So thinking about not just physical activity, but nutritional components and psychological components. And I'm really interested to see what, what, the, what these are what these will show. These are just three that I'm aware of that are ongoing at the minute. 
Now, I'd like us to come back to Edward and Ed, Edna for one final time as they, as they talk about the future. I've talked a lot about outcomes, but I want us to just finish by thinking about what are the outcomes that really matter most? Most of the data I've presented have been, it's been regarding mortality, hospitalization and healthcare utilization, because that's what most studies report. But I don't think it's what's most important to patients. When you look at qualitative studies in advanced CKD populations and, and those in older populations as well, the outcomes that often feature highly are symptom management, maintaining function and independence and being able to participate in social roles. And with that in mind, we're in the process of trying to understand what matters to older people living with frailty and CKD and their caregivers as we develop a, a study looking at comprehensive geriatric assessment in advanced CKD so that we also we measure what outcomes matter. You know, there's no point doing an intervention if we're not measuring the right and, and, and we're not measuring outcomes. It's not improving what's important to the patients. So fingers crossed we, that will uh, we'll progress. Now, this is going to seem really obvious, but I'm going to hammer this home anyway. <laughs> um, I've used this, this, this overarching principle of person centered care is of paramount importance to caring for people with living with advanced CKD and frailty. It's why I wanted to share those video clips of Edward and Edna so that we keep the person in mind throughout to try and understand what is important to them, their goals, their values and preferences. The broad healthcare needs assessment, I think, is where geriatric assessment comes in. And once you've established goals, values and preference and have a holistic understanding of a patient's healthcare needs, can we truly make an informed shared decision with patients, whether that be regarding future kidney management decisions, targeted interventions, or advanced care planning. So um, I'd like to finish with some take home messages. Hopefully I've addressed the objectives that I set out uh, to do, uh, to address. Um, so frailty is highly prevalent in CKD. It's independently associated with adverse outcomes. There are these two principal conceptual frailty models, frailty phenotype and frailty index. But actually, in practice, when it comes to frailty assessment, a simple screening tool like the clinical frailty scale is something that you might want to apply for it to identify individuals who may benefit from more in-depth assessment to identify other geriatric impairments that are highly prevalent in CKD. There is evidence evolving for comprehensive geriatric assessment, but I would I would just say let's just start doing it. <laughs> let's let's the, the, forget about the evidence is coming. The, I, I, I hope. I hope, but it makes sense. And if you don't, if you're worried about time, I would just, as I said, remember these four Fs, frailty, falls, function, forgetfulness, start small, chunk it, try and understand what patients' goals, values, and preferences are so that when we are making decisions with patients, we're honoring those and, and we're really achieving person-centered care in, 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 in our, our, as we work with patients. Right, that, that was a whistle stop tour of frailty assessment and management. I'm very happy to take any questions. As you, uh, I, as you can tell, I can I can talk about this forever. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, ho uh, it's, hopefully it's woken you up. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, so thanks, uh, thanks, Andy, for that uh, wonderful overview. Um, we uh, we do have a lot of people in the audience, including uh, uh, a bunch of geriatricians. Uh, but let's oh, there's already some hands up. Uh, Caitlin uh, from the conference room. We can't hear you from the conference room. Sorry, sorry that. Can you hear us now? Yeah, now you can hear. Okay, now perfect. Hear. So I'm a nephrologist, so maybe this is a dumb question for the geriatricians in the room, but it seems to me that frailty, falls, and function are related, whereas forgetfulness seems to be not so much. So you know, when you when you tell us to look at four things, could we possibly just look at two? All right. Can you so, tell us how, how, why those, why, why focus on those three things differently? Um, so I, I, I think it comes back to how, you, what, what you, how you conceptually think about frailty. 
So you can think about physical frailty or you can think of about frailty in a more holistic sense. So a person living with dementia may be dependent on others for care needs and, and may be living with frailty, um, but actually um, functionally, uh, uh, in terms of their mobility, for example, may not meet that frailty criteria. But they would, if you take a broader view of frailty, they would be, be you would categorise them as frailty. And importantly, these things often coexist. You know, an individual living uh, with frailty, there, there is a, there is significant overlap with cognitive, sorry, physical frailty. There is significant overlap with cognitive impairment, and they're clearly important and predictive of outcomes both are when it comes to um, uh, um, you know, the about CKD population um, I, I I haven't actually spoken about what my practice is with with cognition I'd be interested to hear what others think um, my general thoughts are I, I don't I ask patients if they're worried about their memory I ask them if they're worried about it if it's affecting their quality of life and if they say, no, I'm not worried about it, I'm absolutely fine, that I stop there. Because it does generate, I, in some, I think it can generate anxiety and additional tests that sometimes doesn't necessarily change what we do. Um, but I'd be interested to hear what other people's thoughts and practices are. I've kind of gone full, full circle on this. I used to think, oh no, we should be cognitive, we should be doing cognitive screening routinely. So when I mention cognition, it's more just to think about it. It doesn't necessarily mean you do the test. Thanks. Uh, is that a follow up from the conference room? So, I can go so, ahead. I, so I guess if frailty is this larger concept well, again. So then why not? Um, why not focus on the falls function and forgetfulness? It, it just seems to me like when I'm thinking of frailty, I would be it is that holistic concept. So I would ultimately be trying to identify where in frailty someone is having a challenge. Um, and then focusing on that particular challenge. So I, I still I struggle to think how how I either think of it holistically or I think of it as the separate things. And and yeah. maybe it's just a nephrologist problem list problem. Yeah. So so I think I think you you're you're maybe getting you're you're focusing on physical frailty. But be, be, bear in mind when uh, you know f there is significant overlap with other geriatric impairments, and that's why I I, I was I spent. I'm talking about comprehensive geriatric assessment. So you're not just looking at the physical, you're looking at the patient as a whole and thinking about all these different domains. And I, I you know, I, I I said the four Fs, you could you could pick whatever you want to do. I, I mean, I'd be, it'd be great if you did, if, if people were routinely looking at frailty function falls, do three Fs, that's, that's absolutely fine. But I think if we want to think about comprehensive geriatric assessment, there is there are broader things to consider, and that's not just cognition. That's social support. That's the the the, the environment. The spiritual aspects to think about as well. And sim symptom. Th th there's a much broader picture to think about. Um, and and these, if you do the assessment in the in the truest sense, it I think it provides much richer information for us to be able to then inform our decision making uh, with patients that share decision making process. I don't think I've convinced you. Uh, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> if, if we can move along, uh, we have a question from Shirley Wong. Uh, hi, Dr. Nixon. This is not, not so much as a question, but lots of comments. I'm a geriatrician here at the Ottawa Hospital. The entire presentation is music to my ears. I was about to say you talk like a geriatrician, which is great. Um, and I think, you know, you pointed out some really important, um, you know, operational issues, right? Um, clinical frailty scale is what we use here in terms of really be able to screen our patients because, as you, as you said, frailt, um, freed um, phenotype of frailty and also the um, frailty uh, index, they're really hard to do, right? You have to use the clinical frailty scale. But what, what happens if you screen somebody as frail and what do you do after that or pre-frail, mild, moderate? Um, and, and to tell you the truth, you know, not everyone can be referred to geriatrics. There are around 400 geriatricians in the entire country of Canada. Okay, it's, it's a very small number of geriatricians. So having these extra other people that are trained in doing some element of geriatric assessment is very important. And we use that in geriatrics as well, because we actually have geriatric outreach assessors in our community that goes to people's homes and they are specially trained nurses, 
or occupational therapists or social uh, physiotherapists, and they do those home visits, but they're not right now targeted for CKD population, therefore the general population. So basically primary care physicians refer to the centralized intake geriatric program, and then they, you know, they send these people out into the community and then they identify who actually needs to see a geriatrician. So there's that screening process. In our hospital inpatient setting, you know, once again, it's, it's a challenge when people do refer them to our clinic or for our team to, for consults. Once again, we, we can only see so many consults right in a day so so it's a process and we, we work with teams so it's excellent that you know if you start to think about identifying frailty in the the um, nephrology uh, CKD population specifically using the clinical frailty scale um, and there's actually Dr. Dan McIsaac who's an anesthesiologist who's actually big on frailty research at the Ottawa hospital he created one of these training modules for staff to use online training modules for anybody to use uh, to teach people how to do uh, clinical frailty skills sort of ratings. And he talks about how it's dynamic, how, you know, what you need to look at. So that's already in place, but I don't know how many people throughout our hospital actually uses it, right? Um, I've collaborated with um, respirology, actually didn't, they include clinical frailty scale in their uh, COPD pathways on inpatients. So there are certain specialties are starting to look at this more in their day-to-day -day clinical practice in our hospital. But the challenge, as you said, is, in your limited practice, you know, you're not a geriatrician, what do you focus on? And the point about, you know, we can't screen everybody for cognition because the evidence shows that there's no point screening general, general older adult population for cognitive impairment, but certainly if people raise it as a concern themselves or their caregivers raise it as a concern themselves uh, about the, the patient, then, then, okay, you might want to do something about it. So I think your question for your patients is, Bang on, right? You don't want to ask, you know, you just ask them, are you worried about it? Or is the, the caregiver worried about it? If not, great, you move on to the, but the physical function stuff is really important. The mobility stuff is really important because that's something you can actually do something about right away. And, the, you know, if there's cognitive impairment, yeah, you might need further referrals to a geriatrician for diagnosis, but there's no cure for dementia, but you can put in supports. But the stuff about mobility, decline, poor nutrition, sarcopenia, which is just really loss of muscle mass, muscle power and function. Those are stuff that, you know, I suspect you're already addressing in the nephrology world because our nephrology team, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong with my fellow nephrologists, because you do have dietitian, you do have physios, you are looking at those things, you have social worker. So you already have the infrastructure to do something about these problems if, when, and if you identify it. So, so I, think, I think there's a lot that can be done. And, uh, and I think, yeah, you're, the way that you're screening for cognitive concerns, I think is bang on because there's no good evidence to say we have to screen every single person. That being said, um, you know, having vascular risk factors is a huge risk factor. They're all huge risk factors for cognitive impairment, right? When you have vascular disease causing renal disease, guess what? There's cerebral vascular disease too. But um, anyhow, those are just my comments. Hopefully I was not rambling, but I just want to congratulate you on an excellent talk. Thank you so much. That that means it means a great deal. Also, um, just to say that I'm talking like a judge. I mean that that that's music to my ears. I'm, I'm, I'm I mean, yeah. Thank you so much. And and. But what what I would say is I, I I'm not a geriatrician, and I absolutely would would love it if we if there were geriatricians that could come work with, uh, you know, with us more closely in in our in our centre. But I I just know how busy they are. In, in the UK, it's the same. There are you know, ev everybody wants. A geriatrician to help support the care of um, older people within within you know, whether that be oncology, surgery, you know, respiratory as, as you mentioned. But uh, there is there is, I think we as as a certainly within nephrology, my 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 view is that we have got to take okay. some ownership of, uh, ownership of this. We need to upskill. We need to which start one? doing some of the basics as you mentioned. That that, that no, which that, Dr. Wong. Um. Okay. Now, c coming back to yeah. Um, thanks. The, the cognitive import point. There was one thing that, that I was thinking about as we were talking. Uh, th obviously, there's the question about can you do something about it? I think there is sometimes it's worthwhile thinking about it because, for example, you have a person receiving hemodialysis and uh, you might be a little bit concerned about their memory. And actually, I think it, it, in that situation, you might it might be a useful opportunity to think about advanced care planning and, and actually asking the person um, and family about are there circumstances in the future 
in which they may not want to continue dialysis. For example, if there's a point in the future where they, they, they're they unable to recognise family members, etc., because the cognitive cognition has, uh, has deteriorated. So I think when it comes to advanced care planning, I think some, it's sometimes helpful to, to have an awareness of, of, of the cognitive side of things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so there is a, there are some chat messages which are mostly supportive. Uh, but if uh, if I could ask a couple of questions, so there are a couple of questions in the chat. But before I go there, uh, a bunch of the 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 discussion is about you know how difficult it is uh, to assess this, and that electronic frailty index seems attractive to me. We have an EMR. Is that something that can be easily incorporated? That uh, you know Tom Wilkinson uh, study. Um, so in, in, in principle, yes, it does depend a little bit on what data that you have. And there are, I, mean, I don't know if I can, I have actually included it because I thought this might be a question. There, there is, there are, pub, there are publications on how to construct your own frailty index from existing, uh, existing data set. Um, but you're going to need to work with your, you know, your, your, your data analysis to, to, to try and develop that. But I think, um, there are other kind of ele electronic ways of trying to assess frailty. There's something called the the ho uh, hospital frailty risk score that uses hospital electronic care records. It's not quite as well studied in 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 CKD populations. So there are other other ways of doing it. But what I would say is, when it comes to these kind of risk scores, again, they're they're thinking about frailty in kind of a multi multi dimensional way. And, and it's very good across the population, but it, you still need to assess the person in front of you. So, you know, it, that, that's when I think there's still value in performing a clinical frailty scale assessment to try and, you know, try and understand and, and categorise the person in front of you's frailty status. And, and also thereafter think about the, the, uh, these other geriatric impairments. And, and as I've said, you, using something like, like uh, geriatric assessment. Cool. Thank you. We'll look at that. Uh, and uh, so Mark Kenny is asking in the chat about uh, many of our patients often have multi-morbidity, right? Like diabetes and heart failure. And how can you tease apart the CKD frailty relationship from these comorbid conditions? Are there omic studies investigating specific pathways from CKD to frailty? That's a that's a good question. That's a good question. There is certainly um, uh, there's certainly work being done in this, but I, th I don't think a, a kind of a, a you know, a, a, a definitive biomarker has been identified. But I, I, what I would say is that, you know, the, the, these all these conditions, you know, um, it's cumulative, isn't it? It's, it's erosion of that you know, homeostatic reserve. And the more conditions that you have, the more likely you are to have erosion of that, of that homeostatic reserve, leading to, 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 you know, to adverse outcomes. So like, like I showed you on that kind of like a big data study that we had, you know, there, there was worse outcomes if you had CKD, but you couldn't really tell on that graph because it was so, so close. And actually, it was whether you, if you had severe frailty, that was the most important thing. So I, I think um, we need to be just thinking about this. And and, our, and it's difficult because, you know, our job is as nephrologists to think about CKD. But actually, if we take a step back and look at the person as a whole, uh, I think that's that, that's that's where the, the, you know, the value of frailty assessments and geriatric assessments comes in, because that's where we're going to get the I think the biggest bang for our buck when it comes to to interventions and improving outcomes. Fantastic. Um, you, you should look at the chat later on. There are a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of praise coming from our geriatric uh, colleagues for your talk. Uh, uh, and, and there's also a link for the rest of the audience to the um, uh, Dan McIsaac's uh, CFS okay. uh, module, uh, which apparently takes about 15 to 30 minutes today. Uh, we have that in the chat. Um, uh, if you have time for one last question, we are almost at time. Uh, Anna uh, Ruiz is asking about uh, what do you use something for transplant assessment and to waitlist patients like do you use some frailty assessment uh, like the six minute walk test? Um, that's a that's a really interesting question um, and one that is an entire talk and in fact I recently gave a talk about this so I, I definitely think there is a value in assessing frailty in in transplantation for, for lots of lots of reasons one you're going to identify individuals who are older but robust who actually were being perceived as frail two you're going to identify those individuals who are perhaps living with frailty but we, we might be able to do something we might be able to reverse their frailty status and optimize them before waitlisting or or indeed when they're on the waitlist um what are we doing locally well i, I i'm actually involved in, in the 
the Northwest Network, and we're in the process of trying to develop a pathway for, for assess, assessing frailty. But uh, at the minute, I think it's very individual what people do. And that, you know, I, I certainly, up until recently, was working in a transport assessment clinic, and 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 I would assess frailty using the clinical frailty scale. But I, I, again, I think there's it, there is a need for uh, more objective assessments, assessments like the frailty phenotype, where you're going to do walking speed uh, and, and grip strength, um, because I, I think it provides um, more transparency when we're having those conversations with patients, because the, the evidence base is so much uh, uh, more robust and, and, and it is a lot more objective than, than the clinical frailty scale. Fantastic. Uh, and with that, uh, on that note, uh, we will uh, uh, conclude the grand rounds. Thanks again. Uh, Andy for presenting to us on frailty uh, and for the great discussion. I think we may take this back to our geriatrician colleagues and see how we can uh, incorporate uh, more, you know, systematic assessment uh, uh, of, of uh, frailty in, in the dialysis unit and the CKD unit as well as in the transplant center. Um, uh, thanks again. Well, thank you so much. It was lovely to meet you all and, and, and yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions later if anyone, anyone wants to contact me. Fantastic.